Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Thursday, June 13th uh, Planning Board uh, hearing. Before we start with a 5.30 presentation, I don't see anybody in public, but if anybody's here that wants to talk about anything that's not on the docket officially tonight, just raise your hand and we'll jump into that. If not, then we can start with the presentation of draft form base code concepts. And I'll we'll turn it over to the two of you. All right. Well, we're going to, I'm Peter Flinker. This is still assessment. Um, thanks for having us. We're, we're appreciative that we only have to spend half an hour, but we have like an hour and a half of materials. So one question is, we have, um, we've been working on a uh, sort of a master plan for downtown Florence, so that's sort of one presentation. And then there's um, sort of the next steps of the form-based code for downtown Northampton which is another presentation. Mm -hmm. So we could do two really quick 15-minute presentations, or you could pick one or the other. I'd imagine the Florence thoughts? one is, or maybe not, Florence is quicker than, uh, if we had a half-hour Florence-based conversation, would that be more beneficial than, than uh, Northampton? Like, you can't do Northampton in 30 minutes what you could do in Florence, or is it? Are it's sort of equal. I mean, I, I, I don't know. Well, you know, know what well, might be things. interesting, actually, since central business is pretty well established because we have the central, we have architectural guidelines, we sort of have that. The one issue about central business is looking at um, areas that might be treated slightly differently from the existing condition. But, um, so from that perspective, it's sort of a, um, almost massaging what's there. Right. So Florence is kind of a whole new animal. So maybe you want to spend the time on Florence, and then for the next meetings, we can even yeah. go deeper into Florence and then add Northampton. If you We're going to get to all of it, but yeah. I'm thinking maybe since Florence isn't. Yeah. Yeah. I'm good with that. Our good. Yeah. Florence is certainly a more, a more fun presentation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. well, could, could yeah. we just um, summarize what's the overall kind of process that we're looking like your timeline? Um, what is this part of? Are we going to be looking at this form based code at another 10 <coughs> board meetings and then open it up to the public? Or how does this process work? Um, I think it really depends how much time you want. I mean, we'd like to move forward. Their contract ends at some point. Um, but we don't want to rush it. So I think the answer is when you're ready to move to the next level, we want to move to the next level. But you know, we want to do it right. And the next level would be? Formally doing code, formally, you know, doing, we had community engagement. You said something uh, community engagement. Yep. But at some point it becomes a formal public hearing process okay. and, and goes to itself. Okay. So. The, the other thing to say for context, so we've we're been building this steadily. So we started this as we had this public health grant for how do we encourage more walking and how do we think about the public realm. Something's traditionally been about the private realm. And so we had a grant, they started the work downtown. We then got a planning grant, which allowed us to spread to Florence, allowed us to do more downtown. And then we just got money to look at two family homes. So the other thing is we're trying to keep moving through these steps. Wow. So I, you know, I'd like to keep moving, but again, I want to get it right. So you guys take as much time as you need. So there's basically two steps to to this process from our perspective. The first is identifying what people want Florence to be like in the future. And then the second one is drafting any zoning changes needed to implement that vision. So we spent a pretty good amount of time trying to figure out what people want Florence to be like. And we did a fair amount of public outreach and then um, developed a concept plan for Florence. And the idea is that that concept plan has enough detail in it that people in Florence and the rest of Northampton can say, yeah, that's what I want. And then the zoning standards um, reflect that vision, or, or sort of derive from it in a way. Just for context, you all know, there's a third step which isn't part of their contract that fits in this. So they're doing the, you know, the visioning part, and then the zoning, the mayor's given us $100,000 to, to do the design of some streetscape, public streetscapes. And so we're taking advantage of the consensus they have for the in Florence, and that's how we think about the public the streetscapes. In what form did the public outreach take? Um, okay, so we had, <laughs> uh, we had a focus group with the Florence Civic and Business Association, which um, 
made it into the Gazette, and we ended up with probably 60 people at it. Um, so it was a mix of business owners, property owners, and neighborhood residents. And then we also had a public forum in Florence, which was a packed standing room only crowd at the Civic Center there. It was probably 90 to 100 people. Um, we did this parking day event that's up on the top left there, which was something we were doing anyway in collaboration with the UMass and the Conway School, where we transformed the parking space into a small parklet for a day. Um, and during that, we basically sat outside and talked to people as they passed by to get their opinions about what was working and not working in Florence. Um, so that was actually really useful because we reached people who don't come to meetings um, and heard things like from this gentleman who said, I hang out in the park at Trinity Row all summer long. It's a beautiful space. I'm the only person there. Um, but it would be really nice if there were some paths that made it more accessible for, for me and for other people. Um, so the, the key takeaways from a whole lot of public input were that the, the sort of residents of Florence feel like there's a whole lot of parking that is utilized during the day, but still somewhat underutilized, um, and that on nights and weekends it's completely empty, and that the parking, particularly on Main Street, um, on the south side of Main Street, which is where Friendly's and the building wording, which is 40 Main up there, the Valley Medical Group, um, when you're walking down that street, you pass by very large side parking lots, and it kind of breaks up the experience of the street and makes you not really want to walk there. So parking is a big, big concern in Florence with the residents feeling like there's too much and probably the property and business owners feeling like there's not enough. Um, and sharing parking has been, it's happening, but it's also difficult. Um, it's been difficult for some people who want to share parking with other people who have it to, be, to convince them to actually share it. So that's one key takeaway. The second one is that parks like um, the tiny little triangles in front of the Florence City and Business Association, that's in the upper right of the screen, um, are cut off. So that happens on both triangular parks on either end of Florence Center. Um, so they're relative, they're, they don't have crosswalks to them or they don't have a sidewalk where you want them to be. Um, they're also relatively sparse in both their the things that are in them and also in their programming. Um, and there's a really strong desire for a park in the smack dab in the center of Florence. So people look at Pulaski Park and they say, we want that in Florence too. We want a place where we can um, grab a cup of coffee and go to the library and then bring our kids to the park and hang out. So it's building more of a, a gang's walking trip. There's a sense that people live in Florence. They like that it's a walkable center, but there's just not quite enough to do um, to make them want to walk there. And they think that if there was a park that was really dynamic and that was a gathering place, they'd be more likely to take advantage of the walkability that's there. Um, streetscape was a, a, a strong theme that, particularly on the south side of the street, the friendly side, um, the Florence Family Pizza Restaurant side, the sidewalks are narrow um, and not sufficient, and that there just needs to be generally more attention paid to streetscape, and there need to be more efforts or better efforts to plant trees so that they survive over time. Um, and then, you know, people, in terms of uses, people see Florence as a sort of, one person put it as a family friendly, walkable, village center, and people in Florence seem to really like that there are these local serving businesses, that there's still a hardware store and a florist, and there's a used bookstore, and there's pizza restaurants. So they like what's there. They like the same or more of those local serving businesses. They don't see it as a tourist destination, obviously. Um, they're desperate for somebody to open a sit-down restaurant. Um, and then the, the final theme was that the quality of buildings that have been mixed, built, have been built in Florence have been mixed. Um, and that there have been some sort of key mistakes made that people have strong feelings about. Um, particularly among those are the handicap ramp in front of the new building on the corner that replaced the mobile station um, that has really 
comes right up to the edge of the sidewalk. The sidewalk is probably five feet. Um, and people feel like that's just not an adequate width, particularly in the winter when the snow gets plowed up. And essentially, the snow gets plowed all the way to the edge of that ramp, and so there's no sidewalk left. Um, we did a survey of buildings, uh, oh, sorry, visual preference surveys, where people put a green dot on buildings that they liked and thought were appropriate to Florence, and a red dot on ones they thought were inappropriate. Um, so the ones that ranked the highest were Live 155 on Pleasant Street. Um, and second, this one in the middle, which is from Providence. So it's got gable roofs and dormers, and it's a little bit more village scale. And then that one in the bottom from South Hadley Commons, again, two stories, or two and a half stories with dormers. It's more of a village scale. Um, the other images that they voted highly were all in that kind of two and a half to three story range um, and more of a wood frame construction than you know, brick sort of Main Street Northampton building. Um, and there was a lot of conversation around we're a village, we want to stay a village, we don't want to be downtown. So I'm sorry, do people like the one in Northampton? Yeah. The most? Yeah, that rated the highest. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, it's more about Greek, isn't it? What's that? It's more about Greek. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So, I mean, I think that one in part, people like, um, it's a nice looking building. So I think people, it's kind of got the local hero thing going for it. Um, and also, I mean, if you look at the, the space in front of the building, it has those granite blocks and it has some trees and it has a little bit of a setback from the sidewalk. And I think that's part of what people respond to in that building. Um, the height, every other image of a four-story or a five-story building, people said was inappropriate in Florence. So, um, so like these. These were the ones that were rated the least appropriate. So five-story contemporary building in Amherst. Uh -huh. How about we do this? Okay. Um, a five-story contemporary building in Amherst, or that one in the middle, which looks like it's four stories, but they're actually double height floors, so it's really more like a seven-story building. Um, or the one on the bottom from Natick Mass, which is, you know, it's four stories in part of it, five stories in others. It's kind of a neo-traditional building, but it has some contemporary materials on it, and it's right up against the sidewalk. So those are the kinds of things that people in Florence feel are inappropriate. In terms of the public realm, uh, in general, they, people supported like a more green public realm than what we have in downtown Northampton. So more plants, um, kind of a more loose environment, and a lot of support for bike infrastructure and bike facilities. And then least appropriate, the storefront display, I think they respond to the messiness of that image. Um, that interesting parking lot design where I think they're responding to just, we don't want any more parking, and also there's some people who don't like those in parking. Um, and then that sign at the bottom where people felt like it was too big. And they're probably also responding to the, the bar. So the so key summarizing <clears throat> All of what we heard, I think the key design directions are it's important to improve the sidewalks in the street and keep them in, in sort of a village style. Um, and we've been working to figure out exactly what that means. Encourage the consolidation of parking lots and sharing of parking lots and do whatever we can in zoning to incentivize that or just make it easy. Improve the green spaces, well, the access, the design, and also the activation of those green spaces. And fill in the gaps along the street with new buildings and maintain the village scale character and diversity. So, Peter is going to show you what we've come up with for how that would look. So, we created this um, <coughs> digital model of whole downtown Florence. So, this is what it looks like today. And those buildings are, are the, the buildings and the trees are pretty much pretty carefully detailed and worked out. So that's, you can see sort of the lack of trees or how tiny the trees along Main Street are compared to the big trees that are in the back where all the 
the good soil is. Uh, so one of the things we're trying to get across is that this is not just about what happens on the private lot. A lot of it is what's possible uh, with people either working together on private lots or what we can do collectively as a city to redesign Main Street. So this first image is just replanting Main Street and then consolidating several of the large parking areas. Because one of the things you realize looking at an ortho photo is that there's a lot of parking, but it's separated on individual lots and very inefficient. So if you could just connect the parking around the back and link those lots together and redesign them, you can open up a lot of space for redevelopment and start to have more of what you need, which is central lots that people can find and then park once and walk around the center. Are those publicly owned lots? These would be privately owned lots. So that's one of the interesting wrinkles is how do you make that happen. <laughs> yeah. You give away one? Well, uh, so we get more into implementation. We can talk about it. Part of that is providing incentives. Part of it is, um, you know, does the city take over some of those with additional incentives for, for zoning and so on? Some towns have sort of adopted the policy of, well, we're, if you give us the land behind your building, we'll not have you, we'll not require you to put in any parking at all, and then the city will do it. And uh, so that acts as an incentive for, it allows higher density. Or you can just encourage people to work together and uh, hope for the best. So this is uh, then the infill development. So you can sort of see on a broad scale, there's probably infill opportunities for six or eight sort of larger buildings, but not that many spots. And most of it is in the center as Dylan pointed out, there's this big gap between the Northampton Health Center and 40 Main, uh, which historically had single-family houses on it, and then they tore those down back in the, the 60s and 70s to put in some, unfortunately, 60s and 70s type architecture. So this is then looking with the Civic Center building in the foreground, looking as it is today, uh, east on Main Street. This is the uh, several ideas. One is replanting the street with tree, street trees, and then also taking the park there, which now has that sort of speedway around it where people careen around the corner and try to get through the light before somebody can cut them off. So it's really unnecessary, we think, uh, widening the intersection, straightening it a little bit, and putting in a turn lane. Then you could close off that entire segment of the street that's to the south of the park and work it up to the sidewalk. And then there's the, the infill buildings so you can see mostly further to the east on Main Street. This is sort of illustrating right outside the uh, soft serve and Florence Bank, um, sort of windswept and sunbaked plaza where none of the trees seem to last very long. Uh, so one of our challenges is to try to figure out a tree planting spec uh, that'll actually produce something like this, which is trees which grow at least as well as a lot of them have down Pleasant Street where you have those locusts which go up and create a nice um, sort of shaded environment. So we're trying to get across sort of multiple layers of implementation between the public realm and the private realm. This is a big change. This is the existing conditions with Florence Bank and uh, the health center is right in the foreground there, that big low building. And that's the Florence Bank ATM with a turnaround in the center of the slide. And then this is taking the turn of uh, the, uh, the ATM and the, uh, the drive through putting it in the back in between their existing parking lots. And that opens up the space along the street for a new park. And then also an opportunity for a beautiful building that would face the park. This land is all owned by Florence Savings Bank, and so that's um, an opportunity in that they, they could easily uh, do something with that land, and hopefully if they need room for expansion, uh, the building could either be a smaller building like this, which keeps some of the existing trees next to it, or a larger building that could be a little bit more of a landmark. So another thing we're trying to get across is that there's not one exact style of building or size of building that fits. Um, 
but that we want all the buildings to adhere to certain principles, which is basically creating a strong edge along the street, having active uses opening up onto the sidewalk, and uh, apartments and offices upstairs that <clears throat> bring people to the downtown. So this is looking from the new park, uh, sort of standing in the middle of where the ATM is right now, looking at the new building, so you could have you know, a typical kind of uh, combination of private space right next to the building, but then public, more public space in the park. And here's uh, another version of that building. But one of the principles is to sort of use uh, sort of cafe style frontages where you could have even, in this case, like garage doors that could be opened up in the summer where the cafes could spill out onto the plaza in the wintertime. People can see in through the glass, see all the happy people enjoying food and drink. And then, so one of the, the key issues we're going to be getting into with the implementations or the zoning is how you separate and, and sort of manage that dialogue between the public space and the private space that's in that, you know, 10 to 15 feet between the building and the sidewalk. Um, sort of fundamental principle, we want all of it to be designed to some purpose, whether that's private or public. And uh, in areas like this, there's could do some really interesting things with a little bit of hedges, a little change of grade, and low walls to separate those public and private spaces and make everything work. This is then looking the other way at that sort of gap in the center of the picture is Florence Pizza and their parking, the health center and their parking, and then the uh, Friendlies and their parking, and 40 Main and its parking. Lots of parking, um, but as, as Dylan said, it's not used only about half of it is used because the restaurants, it's full in the evening, empty during the day, and vice versa with the, the health center and the offices. So it's a great opportunity to link all the parking in the back like this, and then you open up the space along the street uh, for either open space next to the buildings or infill structures such as this. So we're replacing friendlies and uh, Florence Pizza with new mixed-use building that would have shops on the ground floor and offices and apartments above them. And, um, and you eliminate all those curb cuts too. Eliminates all those curb cuts. Basically have one curb cut next to uh, the health center that would go in the back and the other one next to 40 Main. And then everything else would be for pedestrians. Is Friendly owned by Friendly's? I believe it is. So this is looking from, that's Fink and Paris on the left, and Florence Pizza on the right. And then this is the sort of streetscape improvements, trying to create a canopy of street trees. And then that's the infill along the street, really create a continuous wall enclosing the streetscape. <coughs> and then this is looking in front of Florence Pizza the way it is today. <coughs> Excuse me. And then the infill development. <coughs> so one of the things that we're really paying attention to in Florence is this idea of, you know, what is, like Peter said, what is the appropriate thing for the public realm? Um, the space between, between the buildings, but particularly the space between the pedestrian throughway where people are walking in the front of the building. Um, so we're on Main Street in Northampton, it seems appropriate to have buildings right up to the front of, right up to the sidewalk. In Florence, the input we got was that people um, don't feel like that's as appropriate and they want some sort of more village public realm. And I think this is, this is what we think they mean. Um, we tested this earlier this week with the Florence Civic and Business Association and they seem to be in agreement. Um, so we'd like to have more public outreach and confirm that. But basically what's happening is the buildings could be right up to the sidewalk or they could be set back a little ways, um, but there's still active pedestrian oriented uses in that, in that front setback. Um, so it's either cafe seating or it's benches or it's bike racks or it's a really well-designed ornamental garden um, like there is currently at the Florence Savings Bank headquarters. And the other thing that's happening in Florence is that there's a great change, um, particularly on the south side of the street between the sidewalk and the lots. Um, and so we've got to figure out, there has to be some way of making that transition. Either you have to 
cut the lock all the way down and remove the lot of fill, or you need to find a way to transition gracefully from the sidewalk level to the to the building level. And the nice thing in Florence is that there's a good example of almost everything that we want to do and that you want to put into the code. Just have a certain point to it for a second. Do more like this. Part of what makes downtown Northampton vibrant at least six or seven months of the year is the cafe seating on the sidewalks. So and there's very little of that except that Cooper's right now. All right. So maybe some more demonstration to that in these slides might be helpful for yeah. those kinds of things. Yeah, the other thing we're trying to show is having buildings that open on both sides. So if you have this large consolidated parking lot in the rear, uh, such as this, that creates an opportunity to open up those buildings to the back and, yeah. and really make this experience as nice as the one along the street. So here's you can have more cafes, so this would be you know, south facing space behind the buildings, be a little bit quieter off of the street, uh, but also creates a sort of an inviting passage between the, the parking lots and the main street. So it really opens up a lot of opportunities. One of the problems, I mean, I, I like how this looks, but as someone who has a sort of retail business, the, the, the negative part about it is that there, there's a huge value in, from a business perspective with them seeing that there's actual things going on. Mm -hmm. And if they can't see the cars back there, I, I get that it's it's wonderful, it's a nice picture, because we all have an image of New York City, but we're not here, people do drive to, to right. these places. So I, I, I think that in the, the design of this, you have, to, you have to allow for people from the road to see into the, to, into the, parking area. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it, I guess the opportunity of having some sort of access management and bringing it to a few key points is that you can have good signage and people will identify those as the entrance to a shared lot that they know they can find a space. But yeah, that's no, a good point. I think that part of what's happening in Florence though is, um, like I said, I think people, it's likely that it's going to continue to be a local serving area. Right, so you're not driving by the hardware store and you're suddenly like, oh, I need a hammer. You go to the hardware store because you know you need a hammer and you know where the hardware store is. Right, you don't so want to drive downtown. Yeah, it's different from downtown Northampton where it's, downtown Northampton is a destination. You go there, you window shop, and you are surprised. Um, so, and at, at, at this point, Many of the businesses have side parking, but it's actually hidden. Um, you can't see the cars that are there right now. I don't know if that's impacting friendly's business that you can't see that there are cars in the backyard. Right. And there's always spaces along the street now, and this plan actually increases the number of spaces. I thought it was interesting. One uh, of the forums that I went to, one of the retailers mentioned they didn't actually want those sidewalk walkers up in Florence, that their customers come to them and 9 out of 10 are going to buy some. They didn't want to spend their time and their staff's time entertaining these <laughs> tourists or <laughs> the guys coming in a window shop. So I think he was in a minority, I hope so, but still it's a, it's a perspective. <laughs> <laughs> this is looking down at the new Cumberland Farms, and that's uh, Friendly's in the, in the bottom right there, and then this is or new infill development replacing friendlies, but also there's a great opportunity across the street where there's that really, uh, how do I say this diplomatically, it's pretty nasty uh, 1970s dentist office building there on the corner. Uh, but there's an opportunity because they own land that goes behind the Cumberland Farms to consolidate the parking, put it in the back, and put all their uses in a new building that would be up on the street and really contribute to the, the city. But the other thing you can see there is where sort of experimenting with this idea of step backs. So you can have two, two and a half stories right on the street, so it would match the height of uh, Cooper's Corner, but then behind that you could have apartments that sort of step up as a nice sort of penthouse arrangement with a terrace overlooking the street. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's my impression that you have more, they feel be more about housing and residential than business because they're local. The others in field that are showing there, it seems more housing, residential, 
Yes, well, we're assuming that more of the market is going to be filled by apartments and other residential yeah, uses yeah, right. than for the retail. Yeah. And uh, that's sort of an ongoing question is how much do you require retail on the ground floor if there really isn't going to be a market, yeah. uh, especially at the price of these buildings. You know, spend $250 a square foot building a nice building. Yeah. It's hard that's to rent it at the current issue. rate, which is yeah. like $15 a square foot in Florence. When the, when the building on the corner with the handicap ramp that's causing issues, when that was built, you know, I think during one of the presentations, it, it cost just as much to build that building in Florence as it does in Northampton. Sure. But the rents you get or the you know lease rates are not at all similar, and so um, there's that there's that threshold of when it becomes economically reliable to, to physically build this in. Yeah. Right. So right. we're sort of at the point um, that the, the apartment spaces probably do pay the cost of construction in a location like this where people want to live, uh, where people want to find a smaller unit in a walkable area. Um, so that, I think, is probably going to drive the, the, if anybody's going to build one of these, it's because of the, the value of those apartments. And then they'll fill the retail space, the office space, if they but can. It's, it's a key question for zoning moving forward, because this is currently the general business district that requires ground floor commercial. Um, so does that remain for all of Florence? Does it remain for some of Florence? Um, is there some other, does that get tweaked to be more like central business district where it's ground floor, actually ground forces, ground floor uses for the first, what, 20 feet, not for the, firm, not for the whole ground floor? Mm -hmm. So this is the last set. This is looking um, west from the other end of the street that's 40 Main and the Sitco station there on the left. And uh, so this is sort of the improvement of replanting the street, trying to bring the street trees right down past the Sitco station. And then infill, this is replacing Sitco after gas is no longer needed um, with a nice little mixed use building, parking in the back with lots of electric charging stations. Um, and sort of continuing that pattern now. And that's, that's really the last major opportunity for infill. So a lot of it is in that long block between the Chestnut Street and Maple Street. So a lot of opportunity there to do some, some good things. So this is the la last bit. This is sort of the transition to the, uh, the zoning document, which is then trying to capture these ideas in a statement of what do we want the intent? What is the intent of the zoning, right? So we've, uh, we could probably We've done this as well for the other downtown districts. We can probably send these around through email and we start to look at these. But basically, it tries to describe, it's a big block of text, but we're trying to describe in simple terms. You know, that we're trying to create a, a, a family-friendly walkable village center that predominantly serves local residents, accommodates all users of the street, has beautiful street trees and sidewalks that are wide enough and functional and attractive. Uh, buildings are set relatively close together to create a continuous street edge, level of street enclosure, while maintaining the not so close together village scale of the area. We've had a lot of discussion at the workshops of exactly do we, do we want this to be a real downtown? Do we want it to be more of a village? Uh, but I think that from an urban design perspective, the, the principles try to have a continuous edge on both sides, whether that's buildings or vegetation or fencing or something, and have that edge be active and interesting to keep people walking as they do downtown. Um, so that's our time. Is there any, I mean, these, these pictures, I, I, I mean, I love going through, they're amazing. Um, but they all seem so summer-esque in their, in their, in their, in their approach. Um, and I'm just wondering, I mean, and I mean this in a real sense, I mean, so much of our, we you yeah. know it's not fun to, to walk around. Right. So is there an opportunity if what we're doing is trying to create this to sort of think about, you know, if I'm, if I'm trying to promote the, a city to people who want to move here, I want to figure out a way of saying, this is not only a great city, uh, for people who only want to live here, you know, five months out of the year, but they want to, you know, what, what, how do you, I 
is how do you design a city, a city walkable city center that takes into consideration zero degree weather? Yeah. Right. Well, it's all the principles of making it walkable and especially increasing the density and having sort of continuous close together buildings <coughs> make it more usable in the wintertime. And one of the problems in Florence right now is you can walk down a relatively sheltered part of the street, like by Florence Bank. And then you get to a gap where the wind blasts you, or the sun bakes you. So by filling in those gaps, uh, creating continuous shade in the summer, continuous wall of buildings that help to break the wind in the wintertime, uh, and then also having uses close together so you don't have to walk so far. I think all of that makes it more beautiful and more better for business, but also better uh, in terms of the climate. Yeah. And one of the key things we heard at the public <clears throat> forum was that um, snow removal is a major problem. Snow storage and snow removal is a major problem in Florence because it's a it's an east-west main street and so the buildings that are close up to the sidewalk on the south side of that, the sun never can get high enough in the winter to melt the snow on the sidewalk. And the sidewalk is, you know, four to five feet. Um, so when it gets plowed, it piles up on the sidewalk and then the property owners clear it off into a one-foot strip and the plow comes back and it gets pushed back on the sidewalk. And you do see that all winter long in Florence, that the sidewalks basically are not cleared and they are icy. So part of the idea with the, with the streetscape would be that, with the zoning is that, and with um, improving the street itself, is that you're creating enough space for snow storage. To me, I, I was looking at the pictures as the drawings. I live in LA for, to say, for 16 years. Mm -hmm. And it seems like the surge of the new urbanism thing, the whole concept of looking at it, I just have some problem visualizing it here in Florence. Um, it's a concept, I don't know if it's their concept, to a certain extent, how long, how much of that is really there now, in spite of all this work of the brainstorming. Uh, mm -hmm. I just, I think I feel. I mean, the concept of like street life and the, 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 the whole village thing. I mean, it's such a new urbanism that it didn't work over there in many ways. It seems like we're doing something here that I just don't see. That. I think in some ways it's. I mean, it's, it could, in my mind, it could work better in Florence than a lot of places because you have, what, you know, six, eight thousand residents within a, you know, pretty close walking distance or a short drive or bike ride, they're all looking for something to do uh, as, you know, as we do on a Friday night that doesn't take a huge schlep downtown or to another community. If you could just go someplace where it was more than just getting an ice cream cone, I think there's a lot of opportunity there to build those kind of public places and public life. We just had the uh, Florence Night Out, I don't know if any of you attended that, what, 6,000 people came? And I think that was a real eye-opener for the kind of activities, especially the sort of cultural activities and artistic events that could happen in the downtown. I'm not saying that the community is not in here, the population in the back is in here, but it's just, uh, it's like you bring something from outside. I don't know, I just do not know how to express that, but it's just, yeah. When I was at the meetings, I think there was a good representation of young people and young families there that kind of almost take that for an acceptance that they want that new village thing. I think there's some young business people there too. So yeah, I I didn't I didn't I thought they they really assumed it could be a reality, you know, not overnight. But mm -hmm. is there a way? Is there a way to like? Uh, and I don't know if this is outside of the realm of this discussion, but sort of. Uh, liberalize the liquor licenses to allow more restaurants to survive in places like downtown Florence? That would probably help. That is a separate discussion. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, to me it's like, yeah. 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 The one other thing I, that I thought I heard and I think is unique about Florence is that the bike path goes right behind the back end which doesn't exactly happen here downtown. It comes kind of circulates around. It's like, and uh, a lot of people talk about somehow how do we attract those bicyclists who are both in town and out of town into the right. central part as consumers and all. So, and some of those 
um, visuals, you know, do have the spaces, the commercial spaces going up towards the bike path, but mm -hmm. they're, they're looking for ways that they can um, make an opportunity. And that's part of what you said, if some of the, the build-out could be backward-facing, yeah. you know, yeah. activity in the back so when people <coughs> zoom by in the bike, right. say, there's something going on there, let's right. check it out. I thought this, this was great, and um, so you've got a similar presentation for downtown, so we'll look at that one next time. We don't have the beautiful models for downtown. <laughs> <laughs> we have well, a lot of discussions and words okay. and diagrams. We probably have more time on the 27th to sort of take another stab um, at details of this, but also social business. It, you know, we could um, take some of the concepts. I don't know if um, they'll be available the 27th, but we could certainly continue the conversation on the 27th and then into July. Um, you know, we don't have a heavy agenda for June 27th. Are, are there areas where the central business requirements are at direct odds with with form-based code or prison? No, I think it's, it's been pointed out, I think Wayne has said a number of times, you, you basically have a very liberal code, which is essentially form-based, mm -hmm. in terms of there's not a lot of restrictions for uses, and there's a lot of flexibility in the design. Right. Um, so I think, if anything, the, the problem is you don't say strongly enough what you want. So when developers come in, they're not quite sure. Right. Um, so I think a, a big purpose of the, the downtown form-based code is to really say, this is what we want. Please give us this, and we'll support you. Right. Um, that's and that's especially true of the public room. So, so right. you guys sort of grapple with like the Charles Motel. You create a standard for the digital front, but it's not like you can say, you know, here's what it is. It's like right. a developer can know right. front what it is. Thank you both. Thank you. Thanks. Mark, do you have a presentation on digitally or paper? Yes, yes digital. Okay. Thanks, guys. Sylvester Road, Florence Map ID 28-78, and we've got a quick presentation. Sure, I just don't see it uh, reading the thumbnail. The thumb drive, so. Oh, there you go. You don't want to force it in too far. Um, my name is Mark Reed from Heritage Surveys. Uh, Judith yeah. and Karen are here. Uh, they co-own the property, they're sisters. So the property itself is located about three quarters of a mile from Lion Road and Turkey Road, heading uh, to the west. It's a 13.6 acre piece. I'm not sure why this isn't reading it. Um, you can just go to the folder on the lower left and open it up. It's probably a show up. Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't do forget it. 
That's how you're going to beat, yeah. There you go. Yeah. So the uh, overall. So what is being proposed is to create two lots. One would be a flag lot that you see up on the screen there, uh, which is on the top of the page. And the other lot, which is to the south of it, is a standard conforming a and r plan with frontage and areas that satisfy the zone in itself um, so what we're here tonight for is the flag lot permit special permit um, for the site itself and we also have submitted the a and r plan for the endorsement after hopefully approval of the flag lot from the board the sniders or, and, and Karen Corbel, they're, they're selling the lot. So they own the lot. They don't have any intentions of building on it. The lots are for sale. They're currently on the MLS listing for it. So that we conceptually show a house um, in that uh, required circle for flag lots. But a new buyer may have other ideas and other styles of house that um, may revise the plan so that it's just conceptual we are proposing on a kind of a larger scale plan which is the um, driveway plan a proposed driveway going up to service the lot. So it's a nice gradual driveway going up uh, into serving the lot. The lot itself is a uh, majority of it's wooded. So as you see on the first plan that we had up there, uh, uh, it shows a table for significant trees that were shown on a plan that would need to be removed for the construction of a potential driveway. Significant trees being over 20 inches in diameter. So we also noted those. There's nine uh, significant trees that would need to be um, re uh, removed. We kind of designed the driveway. As you can see, the flagpole in itself is, is twice the width. Uh, you have a 50-foot minimum. The width of it's 100. So that we're trying to minimize the amount of tree cutting in order to get the driveway installed. So it's, you know, relatively straightforward, um, one flag lot. Originally we had two, felt that it was better to come to the board with only one um, and not do a common driveway for two, just have one flag lot that meets all your standards. 
DBW had a couple of comments uh, about the um, grade at the entry for the driveways and would like a condition for the driveway that if it exceeds 3%, the first 100 feet need to be paved. Um, that's a standard um, request um, for protecting the street, basically, from erosion from the driveway coming down. Right. Um, and then there's, has it, there's not a stormwater plan that's been filed for this um, because it's not clear whether there would exceed an acre of disturbance. So there should be some sort of flag in the conditions about uh, making sure the subsequent owner understands that if um, combined with these two parcels, if there's more than an acre of disturbance, the stormwater permit would be required. Because the, uh, the owner could push their building lot all the way to the back of this parcel? Well, and uh, also in addition to lot two, which is not under your purview for a special permit, they, the, within a three-year period, it's, it's viewed, it's one lot now, so it's viewed as a common land of development. So between the two lots develop, being developed, it could result in more than an acre of disturbance, which then would trigger stormwater. What they're showing for just this parcel is not. Right. Um, but um, the way the regulation is set up is that they look at the parcel as it is today, so they're asking to divide it into two. Mm -hmm. The way we designed the driveway to the point of the DPW comment is that the, the driveway would, from the edge of Sylvester Road, will be tapered down into the lot at a 1% grade and then start to grade up so that we have a nice transition flat area at the bottom. Uh, and we're, we're well under the 3% threshold for that. The very front of the property, I don't know if you've driven by, um, is, a, is a hay field. Uh, and then it becomes woods uh, to about a um, distance of 50 to 75 feet back is a field. So they're showing us a conceptual plan for the driveway and the house siding. The person who buys the lot two years from now, they build. They can make the driveway twice as long and put their house all the way in the back. It could, that might be an acre of disturbance in itself. Right. Um, we can't limit them to building the house enough closer to the road, right, in order to protect that kind of contiguous forest back there. <coughs> So just, not really devil's advocate, I don't know, just a different scenario. It's like this, if, if lot one was sold and they do over an acre of disturbance, stormwater permits required, five years later, lot two is either sold or developed. But because would they also need to do a stormwater since lot one? Um, so if it's after five years, then they're sort of out of that window. So they wouldn't have to. Three and a half years. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. So our condition is going to have to be acreage based and, and time based. Oh no, we're only talking about lot one. Well, it's so. just sort of yeah. I mean, um, it's just almost. And I think I recommended a condition that um, um, yeah. So condition three. Yeah. If, yeah. If it can, and that's really just sort of a buyer beware that if um, those, that they may need to come back to the DPW only, not the planning board, just DPW for a stormwater permit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Questions, any other by the board? Uh, is anyone here from the public with any questions? No, I was just curious of what, I live right across the street from the field. <laughs> okay. Three, one, five, Are Sylvester. You, your name, ma'am? Carter Dunn. And what's your address? 315 Sylvester Road. Okay. So as you can see from the plan, the, the um, first lot that is adjacent to the existing White House that's mm -hmm. out there, um, the house would be set back quite a distance from the road, just a driveway up to it. Um, they would have to build behind the dwelling, the existing White House, yes. because of the requirement of 
the flag lot, you have a circle, a radius circle, and you have to be built back into that lot. So that one house, definitely by zoning, um, would have to be set back from the roadway. The lot, the A and R lot, could be closer to the road in the field, mm -hmm. um, or back on the lot. We just don't know where somebody might want to build it on the A and R lot. So if someone wanted to build in the second lot, would they have to come back here to go over no. anything about placement? Okay. Yeah, this is just for the flat lot, the lot one. Um, so we keep public, uh, uh, public open for a little bit while we discuss uh, any, any concerns about anything. So, um, just on the tree removal up to the, the top right hand section, yeah. we have tree removal for driveway construction. Do you mention, Mark, I think seven or seven and nine, nine, nine trees. trees, and it's 22 inches of white pine. So, you only know three trees here. There, one of the trees is a, is a large triple pine tree, um, and you know, you can't put your arms around it, and then it splits to three different pine, large pine, yeah. pine trees that it runs. So you count that as a three, a three for Yeah, a three. Okay. So we, we counted the circumference of the base of it, and yeah, which is, you know, three to okay. add up to that on the significant trees. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the large pines out there, they're, they're large and a lot of them are broken off uh, and damaged. So that if somebody wants to build a new house, they're not going to want to have those big pine trees next to their new house that they're going to break off and hit their house. Um, they kind of, unfortunately, pines when they get 60 or 80 feet tall are sometimes more liability than. So, oh, no, I was just going to say, so I would just recommend that, um, I mean, that it's clear also, same thing, buyer beware, the total number of trees to be taken down might uh, be adjusted based on the house location, so that at the time of permitting, then they, the applicant would have to submit um, plans for how many trees would be coming down. Um, and then we can confirm, because 134 inches of replacement is quite a, a number of trees, 70 right. trees, potentially. Right. Yeah. And you have to take down, like, if a tree is potentially healthy, but as you said, could potentially spawn your house, is that is that a tree that you're allowed to take down because it's there? You can take it down, you just have to replace it. If yeah. it's healthy, then it's healthy. Got it. Um, your fear of future doesn't okay. make yeah. it unhealthy. Yeah. Got it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Can you remind me what's the significance of the circle again with the with the house? What if they choose to build back here? And so the circle is required to show that the the, the width of the lot is at least um, one and a half times the frontage, and they a, a structure has to fit in a portion of the parcel that is that wide. So the circle can move. I mean, this lot is very big. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a lot of locations where this a new house could be located, but the, um, sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes the flag lot boundaries fit exactly outside that circle, and so there's a limited um, number of places where a house could fit. But this is just showing that, in fact, the flag lot conforms to the requirement of having that diameter circle. Um, the, and this is almost the closest it can get. Yeah. Right, so it can't it could, come. Correct. Yeah, so yeah, so that circle, if you look at the circle and the plan, yeah. you could slide the circle You're back in the lot. Right, right. Correct. Mm -hmm. uh, not quite all the way to the back, but it right, it close. Down. Yeah, narrow it down slightly. Does the house on lot one get determined, like if one gets sold before the other, then does the positioning of the house, no, they could literally be like next, like, There's still setback requirements from property line, but yeah, they're not related. I mean, on the um, non-flag lot, it can be located anywhere within the um, setback. You know, as long as it. be odd, but they could, in theory, both be way back on the lot, but right next to each other. Well, and then, yeah. okay, that's what I wanted to know. Yeah. Like, if they build here, does that mean that this person has to build back here? Vice yeah, versa. And can they come on with oak if they? 
they went. Did the road come off? Is that the no, no, that's so a, that's the boundary line. Yeah. So that's an abutting piece okay. of land. There's no problem. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that's the road is on the right hand side of the yeah. the plan. There's um, not uh, that's, there's not city sewer and water on Sylvester Road, right? No, it's mm -hmm. sewer and wells. Right. We didn't never talk about internal sprinkler systems for houses like that or that's a building code issue. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, have you seen, has the applicant seen the comments by staff? I, I did not send the proposed conditions. We talked about the issues about traffic mitigation and tra tree replacement and stormwater. Okay. Um, oh, and I'm sorry, and the, and the solar too, I think, but it didn't, right. um, because the building's not planned, they could But that would be another buyer beware. Right. So that would still be a condition? Yes. So because it's site plan, because special permit site plan, they have to show the structure solar ready. They can't. They're not doing that because they're not designing the house. Right. So it's this is in that arena. So it has to. It's going to carry forward no matter, no matter who the owner is. What does solar ready mean? It means that the roof um, orientation or structure and structure of the roof has to be built to. Um, um, be, uh, to uh, be able to accommodate solar panels, and if there's no way that can happen, they could come back and show that there's a place on the ground that would be um, <coughs> approved, or be a, um, an alternative location. But um, it doesn't mean that the applicant has to install solar, it just means that the structure has to be set up so that in the future, if they decided to do that, they could. What, what if there's so many trees that you'd have to cut down a whole lot of trees to make solar feasible. Um, so they could come back to the planning board and ask for relief on that? We have a situation like that on a project. They developed this whole thing and then they came back and asked to cut some trees because it's so um, Right, so that's the, right, yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Um. <clears throat> So for clarification, I'll just go through some of the issues. Some seem to be, uh, these conditions, some seem to be applicable now, and some are for a future buyer, but all would be conditions uh, if we were to approve this. So stormwater, that's a buyer beware, I'll use that term, when it's developed, if they uh, disrupt an acre or more. Traffic mitigation is a condition for now, correct? Um, well, it would be traffic mitigation would be required at the time of occupancy. So again, okay. that's sort of so that's a buyer beware. Okay. They're going to have to be. Um, yep. uh, solar ready or the roof orientation. That's a buyer beware. Uh, significant trees. Uh, those have been delineated, but that would be another buyer beware for when the work is actually done. Mm -hmm. um, Yeah, so the, the paving of the drive well they're so right. the driveway away, so that doesn't need to be included, but the the stormwater did you already say that? Stormwater yeah. permitting is also sort of for the future owner. Though the driveway the, the details reflect what is required. This is all a this isn't being done now, this is a right. potential. So right. that would also be uh, a condition as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So Yep. I, I don't understand the traffic mitigation. Anytime someone builds a new driveway? No, a new lot that is triggered triggers site. So site plan, if you're in the site plan process, uh, approval realm, mm -hmm. um, so you're not doing a buy right project. So this is not a buy right, right. Light mm -hmm. lot. The lot number one is, or lot, the other lot. Two, two, is. two oh. is, and yeah. one is not. Right. So, um, applicants who are um, don't have by right development need to address their incremental impact to the network and so um, because it's and it's divided by district and how far from the center and based on the number of trips generated for single-family homes so and uh, peak trips so we are assuming that there is one peak trip per single-family lot, mm -hmm. and then because of how far it is, all those trips are going to be driving trips, they're not going to be bus right. trips, they're not going to be walking right. trips. So that's a formula in the zoning. 
and, and it's not a criteria, there's not a, a, a threshold that they have to meet or exceed. As soon as you build a new family lot, you're exceeding that threshold, right? Right, or, you're contributing you're to contributing the network. A and new, so, right. A new house and a new home. Yep. And that's usually a payment in lieu of. But what, on a small scale like this, it would be, whereas a larger project, there might be crosswalk improvements or sidewalk improvements that the applicant can take on. So we're not asking them to do a little sidewalk here? No. No. In, in hopes of down the road, Sylvester Road becomes... <laughs> okay, good. Right. The new Florence Center? Right. right. Yeah, exactly. So the blocks would be nice, though. How do we condition... How do we make these conditions for the applicant when they're not really for the applicant? Well, it board? runs with the property, so it's it doesn't you don't have to worry about who's getting the condition. It runs to the on the permit, okay. so it's um, you know I've written them here as the applicant, but um, you could say the property owner. But it it, right. it gets it, recorded it gets and it's part right. of the lot, and so the person who's buying it sees that on record and and is taking ownership of that permit gotcha. and those conditions. And the, the person who monitors those conditions is the building inspector? They don't so come someone comes in for a building permit um, and then these are, you know, available. You know, we look at the permit that was issued and see what pre-permit, pre-building permit conditions are required, what post, you know, pre-certificate of occupancy conditions are required. Any questions from the public before we close public comment? No. I'll make a motion to close the public here. Second. Second. Anyone? All in favor? Opposed? Comment? Okay. Um, so, any discussion?
favor? George. Opposed? We're good. Okay. Um, the next one is the, uh, the dog park um, down on Glendale. Yep. yep. So this A&R is to separate out the open space parcel that was part of the cluster approval. So they have offered to give the open space that's required to part of the cluster to the city. So this is to divide that land in the back so that the, the purchase can move forward, the, the uh, transfer of the land can move forward. Is this the private dog park? Or yes, is this yeah. the private dog park. Well, off one, yeah. yeah. So nothing's happened with this space, yeah. No. So this is in getting in preparation yeah, yeah, yeah. for that because they can't pull a building permit or do anything until they um, um, either record a conservation restriction on the property or give it to the city or whatever right. they decide to do. So they decided to give it to the city. Well, actually, it's good. So there's two pieces of it. Um, that, so there's a conservation. There are two parts of it. I think the conservation part and then the part that the city's buying. The CR part and this part of the CR. Motion. I'll make a, what's the name of the applicant? Um, Wagon Trails Dog Park. I'll make a motion to approve the ANR application by Wagon Trails Dog Park. Uh, uh, so Glendale. Glendale. Yeah. Second. Yeah. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Okay. Okay, and then. What? Okay, so now this one, I'm not going to go through every sheet. I'm just going to tell you about it. This is Damon Road takings. These are Damon Road takings. There are 14 sheets of little slivers of property from private property owners for the Damon Road re reconstruction. And the city council has already approved the order of taking. At the roundabout or at this side? It's the entire corridor uh -huh. from um, exit 19 to King Street. King Street. Um, so the construction is going to start this coming year, but they need right, to do sure. this first. So, um, I mean, the roundabout work starts. Right. right. This is a separate project, so that's going to start too. So we could we could put the brakes on everything if we don't. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. Are you yeah. telling me? Do you want? It? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know what? The good thing is, if the project, if the construction is all happening at once, you've got, yeah. you know, right. the Hatfield yeah, roundabout, right. David right. Road, just get it done in two years. Boom. Right. Right. Nobody will go to work. Can't go to the grocery store. They'll be gridlocked. Yeah. Right. 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 They're all going to go to Florence. So um, officially they need to be endorsed um, for the taking because there are little strips going everywhere, so I need an endorsement for that. Motion to endorse. We don't need 16 motions. No. You can just do it as a package. Charge, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Lots that are part of the performance guarantee that are under covenant, um, lots eight and nine, and they want to swap it to six and ten because they have buyers for eight, number eight. So um, it's pretty standard that um, developers do that through the process as they're getting closer to completion. Where is this? I'm sorry, it's State Hospital, Higgins Way, which is the. Well, that's the Pecoy area, right? Pecoy, yeah. yep. Yep. So it's Pecoy's project. And um, they have two lots, one of which is um, uh, they have a buyer, um, but it's under covenant, so they want to swap it. What does under covenant mean? Uh, it's a lot sale covenant, which means they're not allowed to sell the lot because it's part of their performance um, guarantee, financial guarantee. Oh. So they can't sell the lot until the planning board says all the work has been done, but they can um, swap the lots that are under that restriction. So it's a collateral. So it's like that lot is the covenant, but now we want to sell that lot and we'll hold this yes. lot as the covenant. Exactly. Thank you. 
in the, the lot any less desirable. Less desirable. They're all pretty similar. Similar, okay. Yeah. Yeah, one of them. One of them that's open. I was just driving through there the other day because a friend was interested in them. One of them backs right up against the other development that's up above it, mm -hmm. and it's, there's hardly any backyard. I think they're probably going to be the last lot to go. I don't have the maps. So I don't know if it's eight or nine, but I don't think they're all the same. A lot of the other ones look out to the conservation land, right? Which is much, and the other ones are kind of backed up too. They also but, have money on the table too, so this isn't the only collateral right. that they have. And uh, none of these lots have any kind of conditions to them. I mean, we ran into a little bit of a buzzsaw when some of the lots in another development were supposed to be subsidized housing or affordable housing. That's not any part of the arrangement. Like, unfortunately, I have to that. So I need a motion. I move to approve the swapping of the lot. Covenant spot. Covenant spot. Second, anybody? Yeah. Second. 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 Any discussion? All in favor? Okay. And then minutes is the last thing we have. Who? Uh, there was a shots one. Was that? That's Wagon Trails. Oh, okay. So we have minutes, which I know everybody read from May 9th and May 23rd. The motion to approve those. I move to approve those minutes. They were fascinating reading. Yeah. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Yeah. Oh, you're there. So I think you're up. Oh, wait. What? We had a, a thing from Coca Cola in there. That's yeah. You didn't read the envelope. Alita insists that she writes yes. on the envelope. I love that. Oh, she oh, loves it too. Oh. I love that, by the way. So whoever's yes. doing that. This yes. is going to be for June 27th. Oh, sorry. I'm going to tell yeah. you what she <laughs> messed up. Right, we'll bring that back to the so, how is the recording of these uh, meetings going? Is the camera on us all the time from the get-go? Mm -hmm. And how do we, is there somebody here, how do we end the recording? When Carolyn gets up and turns it off. After we adjourn. Did you adjourn? No. No, we didn't adjourn. We're still live. So, George is right. going to say something like really important. Well, I wanted to say something more. <laughs> I just don't think it's, you know, appropriate for the camera audience out there. Maybe in a couple of weeks it will be. So, I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor?